Underwriters of the Arizona Mining Review include Mining Foundation of the Southwest, a nonprofit organization based in Tucson, Arizona, working to educate the public about mineral resources and the mineral extraction and processing industries. Amigos, Southwest Buyer's Guide. For almost 40 years, Amigos has worked to provide a better business environment for mining. Pioneer Equipment Incorporated, serving the equipment needs of the mining industry since 1959 and Copper State Bolt and Nut Company, in business since 1972 with 21 branches to serve you. It's September 30th, 2015, and this is the Arizona Mining Review. I'm Mike Conway, and I'm sitting in for Lee Allison, who's out of pocket today. And as always, uh, at the start of the review, we'll start with Niall Nemeth, who's in the, our economic geology chief up in the Phoenix branch office. Niall, uh, I understand that the price of copper has stabilized a little bit, or at least gone back up to about $2.40 a pound. Do we know why that's happening, and do we know if that's that's a positive change and going to stay that way? That, that's a good number of questions. I'll, I'll start with the first. Yeah, beginning about September 8th, 9th, uh, we, we certainly have seen copper change direction in a positive uh, direction, and the price improve. That seems largely attributable to a number of the large producers announcing some cutbacks in production. In particular, uh, Glencore announced that they're going to stop mm -hmm. production at two of their mines in Africa, the Katanga in Congo and the Mopani in Zambia. And that's going to remove about 400,000 tons of cathode copper from the market. Okay, so and how's that going to impact production here? Well, how's Asarco and, and Freeport, what are they, how are they going to respond to that locally? Yeah, you know, in addition, we've seen some cutbacks announced by those two producers. Mm -hmm. The SARCO is going to shut down the Hayden concentrator and reduce some of the uh, stripping at the refine. And those, in addition to the earlier cutbacks, could result in a loss of about 67 million year, million pounds of year production. And then we've got Freeport announcing that they're going to close the Miami mine, and that should remove about uh, 50 million pounds of copper a year. How many people are we talking about all told in the state? Any idea? Um, the cutbacks at Asarco will affect about another 211 workers. Well, I don't think they've laid that many off yet, but that will be the total affected okay. by the new layoffs. And then Freeport's announced that they're going to reduce about 10% of their U.S. Uh, workforce. And I don't know exactly how many people they employ here. In addition to uh, you know various cuts across their mines, they announced they're going to take uh, Tyrone over New Mexico down to about half production rate. Okay. Are there other any other indicators? Uh, copper is looking to come back a little bit. Is there anything else that we can be looking at that's positive? Well, I'm just going to throw out there. Tyrone uh, is about a hundred million pound producer, so that will reduce production there by about fifty million pounds. Okay. So I'm sorry, Mike, what was the next question? Well, I was just wondering if there's any other positive signs on the horizon for us in terms of copper production here in, in the state of Arizona and southwestern U.S. You know, if we pull way back and look at the global situation, we just haven't seen any uh, strong indications that the global economy is getting stronger. Mm -hmm. We still have the concerns in China. Europe's still kind of lagging. You saw the Fed Reserve, Federal Reserve didn't have enough confidence to raise interest rates. so. I think we, before Dr. Copper gets healthier, we need to see a lot healthier global economy. Okay, very good. And I understand that there's been some activity in the Patagonias. There's a drilling program that was getting started down there, or looked like it was getting started, and it looks like a federal court has put the skids on that. Yeah, uh, earlier this month, mid-month, we saw U.S. District Court Judge Rosemary Marquez uh, say that the categorical exclusion to the environmental assessment was not sufficient and that the uh, Regal Resources uh, drilling program will either have to do an EA or, or fall under the conditions that were approved by the Forest Service. And those were deemed insufficient for the cumulative impact of multiple holes uh, on the potential impacts of some endangered species, including the Mexican spotted owl for its uh, breeding and hunting habitat. Okay. Well, not a lot of good news in the state. Is there anything else that's going on in, in Arizona in terms of mining? Silver, gold, anything? Well, Positive there's something the that we discussed last month. I'd just like to amend our reporting. That would be on the sale of the Johnson Camp mine. Oh, yeah. 
we had noted that we hadn't really heard from the company, but based upon the long time uh, from May to, to then, we've, and, and the encouraging word we had heard, that we thought that deal was going to close. Turns out that, uh, probably due again to the declining copper prices and other factors, that uh, they backed away from that transaction. So that property is back to the receiver, uh, Nedbank. Okay. And if somebody's interested in picking up a, a leach copper operation, they should probably uh, go, go see the receiver of Nedbank right. and then get that property out of uh, district court. Okay. Now, other kinds of activity similar to that that's going around the state? Pretty quiet. You know, summer's just ending. We'll yeah. uh, we'll see if the Canadians uh, start coming back. But okay. You know, activity going on in exploration. Not much, uh, you know, big news on the production front other than these layoffs. Okay, very good. Well, let's, um, we greatly appreciate you stopping in, of course, and, and chatting with us about this. I guess we'll, we'll check you out again next month and see if things are where things stand in the state. We'll hope to see continued improvement on that copper price. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Niall. You're welcome, Mike. We're here today in the Mines Building on the University of Arizona campus in the office of Dr. Mary Poulton, director of the Lowell Institute for Mineral Resources, uh, university distinguished professor, former chair of the Mining and Geological uh, Department, and affiliated with Geosciences, Law, and Public Health. Yes. So lots of hats that you wear. And we're going to try and leverage uh, Dr. Poulton's long experience on the economies of mining today and talk about the past, the present, and the future of copper here in the U.S. and, and globally as well uh, over the past 115 years. Mary, the reported price of copper this morning was $2.32 a pound, which is an improvement over mid-August's low yes. of $2.25 a pound. Uh, but the downturn in the copper market, uh, the downturn in the Chinese economy has really cost, the Chinese are consuming about 40% of the world's yeah. copper at this point in time, and they're importing 70% of that. So can you shed some light on, historic light on what's happening with the metals market and where it's going, where it's been, and where sure. it's going to, where sure. we're at? I'll start with, with the caveat that I don't have a crystal ball, okay. and, and my predictions are, are no better than anybody else's, but um, it's a serious question for us because the students came back from summer internships in August mm -hmm. and, and said, you know, am I going to have a future in mining? Right. And, um, and so I started looking at the price history to try and get a sense of whether I thought this was going to be a protracted downturn like I saw in my career, right. or if this was going to be something that was a little more short-lived. And, and I go back to uh, some work that the U.S. Geological Survey did um, looking at economic development, and mm -hmm. there's a sequence of how you consume materials as your nation grows, as your economy grows. And you start with cement because you're building a lot of infrastructure. Right. And then after that, copper, and then aluminum, steel, and then industrial minerals. And then you become a service-based economy like the U.S. And your consumption falls off of right. a peak, maybe 15, 20 percent. And you, and you become steady state. And so if you look at U.S. consumption of all yeah. sorts of things from cement to copper to steel, you can see we're pretty flat over the last 40 years. Yeah, one of the slides that you presented uh, shows that very well. Yes. It was surprising to me. I would have thought it was going on an upward scale, and it's not. Right. We haven't changed much. Uh, no, no, it's been pretty steady. And yeah. so, so then the question was, you know, if we look at, at two things, we look at copper and we look at cement, mm -hmm. and, and we try and get a sense of what's really happening in China, because there's a lot of speculation in the market. Right. There's a lot of confounding factors. And so, um, so looking at just the, the plot of cement right. production in China and comparing it to the U.S., India, and the rest of the world, it's phenomenal. China has been consuming more cement than the entire world combined up to this point, which mm -hmm. tells you a phenomenal amount of infrastructure development. Right. Yeah. Copper has done the same thing. It's just been this exponential increase. And you know, it can't continue forever, right? right. But, but exactly. are we plateauing and coming down or, or what's happening there? So, so one of the things that I did out of curiosity was I plotted cement and copper production sure. in China. Uh, going back to 1970, and it's a pretty straight line, actually. So, so you, there's a linear relationship mm -hmm. between the growth um, that we're seeing in China and their cement consumption and their copper consumption. So, 
if we look at cement as a way to take out some of the speculation in the copper market and some right. of the confounding factors, the impact of the dollar, for instance, is having a big uh, impact on prices. So, so then I went and I looked at copper production mm -hmm. uh, and trends in price. And this is a grossly simple analysis and mineral economists will roll their eyes and slap their <laughs> forehead. But what I did was I looked at the complicated graph of price going back to 1900. Right. So 115 year time series. The prices were adjusted to $2014. Okay. So, so we're dealing with a constant dollar. And we expect over time that commodity prices always fall mm -hmm. right, because of efficiencies of scale and technology. So you expect overall downturns are going to sure. dominate. Sure, absolutely. So I looked at changes from year to year. And uh, so it's basically looking at, at slopes in this graph over 115 years. And what I saw that year on year prices dropped 63 times in mm -hmm. 115 years. And they went up 52 times. Okay. So it was a lot more balanced. I expected yeah, right. the losers to beat the winners, but it was much more balanced than I thought. The average consecutive down years was 2.4 years. Okay. And the average up years was two years. So again, Nicely balanced, much more balanced. Yeah. Uh, max maximum consecutive down years was five. Okay. Maximum consecutive up years was five. So never in 115 years right. have we gone down in price more than five consecutive years. We've never gone up in price. Yeah, exactly. Now we say, well, you know, it's gone up since 2002, but we had the financial crash, right. which brought it down in 08 and 09. Exactly right. So that broke that up and gave us five years of up and down. We are in our fifth year of down copper prices, okay. fifth consecutive year. Well, so, that's interesting. So history would yeah. tell us 2016 ought to be a better year. Now, maybe we're going to break the historical record. Right, you know, right. Who knows? But, but that's promising. But but 115 years, we've seen world wars. We've seen right. global exactly. recessions. We've seen a lot of changes. And so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that history would say next year sure. and maybe even 2017 are going to be better years for copper. Right. So then I started to look a little more deeply. And... And because this graph is very, very jagged, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of volatility there, I wanted to know how many times the price trends were interrupted by just one year down or one year up. Okay. So, so I took those, those uh, instances, seven times the down cycle was interrupted by one good year. And if we discount that, then the average number of consecutive down years would be about seven mm -hmm. years okay. trending down. And six times the up cycle was interrupted by one down year. And if we discount that, then the average up cycle is about 6.7 years. Mm -hmm. So five consecutive right. down or up years, but if we take out some sure. of the, the sure. volatility, it's more like seven years. And then we look at the big cycles, the super cycles people like to talk about. And our long duration upturn was from 1945 to 1973. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, post-World War II years, Post-World right? War II up to the energy crisis. Right. We had 19 largely up years mm -hmm. in that period sure. of time. There were 10 decreases. So it's spiky, but the overall trend was up. And the average price increase uh, during that time was $0.07 cents year on year. Okay. Um, so it was a good yeah, it was right. a good period of growth for the mining industry, and we saw a lot of mines developed right. uh, around here. And then we had the long duration downturn that many of us uh, have exactly. have lived through, from 1974 to 2001, and we had 27 down years overall, nine years up mm -hmm. in that period of time. The mm -hmm. average price decrease was 10 cents year on year there. Um, and then we've had this upturn from 2002 right. to 2010. We had two down years in the financial crisis. Right. And those, that financial crisis shows up in every single commodity no, graph that you can make that. worldwide. Yeah. Uh, but this is interesting because the average price increase was $0.36 cents year on year. Mm -hmm. So we saw an unprecedented price increase uh, in yeah. this last up cycle, largely driven by uh, demand in China. Now, from 2011 to date, we've had five consecutive down years with an average year-on-year -year decrease of 11 cents. Okay. So, so this is Lost a pretty, yes, it's been a steeper downturn right. um, following a much, much uh, bigger yeah. price increase. So 
if the trends hold, maybe maybe one more bad year, maybe. Right. But but maybe 2016, 2017 look a little bit better. And so the, the big question on everybody's mind is is really what's happening in China, mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, you, you know, you're seeing them get hit pretty hard. Right. Brazil as well. So so it's beyond China. It's a lot of the developing nations. Yeah, exactly. That's where the growth. That's where the growth has been. This has never yeah. been a U.S. or, or right. European yeah, story. Europe, U.S. and Europe has been very static, yes. very stable. Yes, exactly. Not much growth in it. Yep. It's all came out of China. Exactly. Now perhaps India or someplace else in yes. the world. And so, so then I started to look at what's happening in cement in China, and I looked at year-on-year -year production changes. Mm -hmm. and, and what you can see is that um, starting in 1970, cement production was fairly flat in China. Sure. The, the economy opened up in 78, so you would expect to start to see some larger increases there. And really, I think starting around 1990 is where we started to see big increases mm -hmm. in cement uh, use in China, peaking in about 2010. And it's been a precipitous decline since right. 2010, which matches up with what people were seeing starting in 2011 with a bear market. Uh, starting to see fewer exports coming into sure. to, uh, exports from the U.S. going out of our ports, um, and so this would tell us that the decline in the Chinese economy is is a real thing. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. serious, um, and the switch to a more consumer-based economy is still good for copper mm -hmm. um, because you still need factories and you're still right. going to be needing to create electrical capacity. So, so for copper. It's still, I think, somewhat of a positive story going forward with growth in well, the world. And, and the question is, in the next sure. five years, what's going to happen? Yeah. Is this a short-term thing or is it a longer term? And it seems like the green energy uh, the green energy industry is going to be using a lot of copper, yes. particularly in solar and particularly in wind. There's yes. a tremendous opportunity for growth there. I, I agree. I think, you know, it's a lot more copper intensive per BTU. Right. Um, plus electric cars and hybrid exactly. cars, which yeah. you're going to see increasingly dominate the car market. And so I think, again, the, the story for copper is going to be a very positive story going forward. What's interesting is if you if you take a fairly conservative growth estimate of about 2.2% mm -hmm. compounded annual growth okay. for copper, and historically it's probably more like 3%, um, but if you take a conservative 2.2 growth right. rate, by 2050 we would need to be producing about 45 million tons of okay. copper. We produce about 18 million tons right, right now. And, and from this graph, if the developed world, the US, the EU, sure. Japan, uh, et cetera, decrease their copper consumption by half, mm -hmm. we would have this tiny difference in wow. the world consumption yeah. of copper. So this is not a developed world story. Yeah. It really is about the developing world. Yeah. And they may go through some fits and starts, but overall they are going to grow their economies, and that's a material-intensive proposition. Yeah. So long-term, exactly. I think you have to be very bullish on on the demand for materials. Well, I think our Arizona mining companies like Asarco and Freeport will be delighted to hear that. Yes, yes. And, and I think also what we know, being in the field, is that it's very hard to discover a new mine. Right. And the odds of discovery historically have been about 0.3%. Sure, sure. Um, and we're not spending nearly as much on exploration today as we were. Um, we're, we're spending about $11 billion last year, down from $21 billion. That's a tremendous drop. It is. And, and a lot of that is from gold sure. uh, prices. Uh, CapEx is way down uh, for companies. And so we've gone into a no-growth Right. No exploration mode now, which means when there's a demand again, it's going to look like 2002 all over again. Right, right. We're going to be short on everything yeah. again, including people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that you know I, I can't predict the price, but I'm still very long-term optimistic, and and I think for our students in the university. Um, they're still getting an incredible engineering education and yeah. they'll find interesting careers. And if they're passionate about what they're doing and, and want to be in this field for the next 45 sure. years, they're still going to have good careers. So there's good news ahead for Arizona Copper because right now we're seeing Asarco and Freeport have both laid off. They've yes. both reduced production. Yep. I think, uh, I think uh, Asarco perhaps has 
has shut down the Hayden concentrator at yes. this point in time. Yes. And so those things could come back online and they're just kind of waiting out this for the sixth year, for yeah. the seventh year to happen and for growth to begin again. And I think it's been a, you know, the companies have reacted um, in very measured right. uh, yeah. ways. And, and I think it's a little problematic what's happening in Chile with the government support of the, of the high cost producers because it's going to leave copper on the market that yeah. maybe shouldn't be there. But, but I think the market is going to be a lot con more constrained. If you look at the LME inventories, mm -hmm. there's no way the price should be as low as it is right now because the okay. inventories are not high. And so a lot of it is sentiment in setting the prices mm -hmm. as, as well as the strong dollar sure. hurting the prices. So I think the prices should look a lot more like they were in 2013 right. based on inventories. Right. And so there's a lot of other factors that are bringing that price down. Yeah. And your students are, you're still training your students and getting them ready, and they're going to be, if that turns around, they'll be ready to go out there and start working in the copper industry and other metal industries. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, of sectors that had a hard time competing with copper and gold. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the construction materials sector, as we right. start to get more construction going, will be a good area. But our students have skills that few other engineers have. Safety, sure. project management, working with big data, yeah, right. sets, uh, sensor technology. Um, and so, so they would be well versed in mm -hmm. expanding their career opportunities and looking around. So, oh. Very good. Well, you've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything that we haven't covered that that you'd want to touch out about? Um, well, again, I think that Arizona is is elephant country, as we yeah. say. There's a there's a lot of benefits to to being in Arizona, being in domestic U.S. production. Sure. Uh, when you look at some of the problems that we have internationally, with, right? With difficulties in dealing with governments and, and uns yeah. unstable workforces and all sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, I think you're so, absolutely right. Arizona is seen as a, at least a stable environment where yeah. people know what the rules are going forward. Yeah. And it certainly takes a while to get a mine permitted, yeah. but at least it's, it's there. It's possible. There is a uh, there's a protocol for doing it, yeah. and people can get it done. And, and the law means something, and contracts yes. mean something in this country. And, and the other thing is, you know, even though we've been mining in this state for for 130 years or more, right. we've only scratched the surface. I mean, we really So there are a lot of fines out there. There are a lot of things. There are. We done. have not looked deep yet. And is I, that right? I okay. don't think there is a single dead district in this state. Yeah, and I think it was either David Lowell or someone else that I was chatting with, and I think it was probably David Lowell, who pointed out, you know, when, when he was first working in the copper industry and the metals industry, they'd look at a mining prospect and they'd say, oh, this is 15 or 20 years. You look back to those areas, and there are 40 or 50 years worth of resources yeah. there, and we continue to develop those resources. Right. So those mines have much longer lifespans than we ever thought. Oh, our porphyry copper deposits are so much larger than the median global porphyry copper deposit size. And, and you look at Marenzi as an example right. where huge production, but every year the reserves go up. Yeah. No matter how much we mine, we seem to have more there. And yeah. I think that's the case in all of these districts is that as we step out and do that brownfields exploration, mm -hmm. there's a lot more resource and reserve there, but there's a lot more at depth in these districts okay. as well. Well, this is this has been very, very promising and uh, very positive, which is which is good because we have been chatting a little bit at, in our offices and with Niall Nemeth, of course, who does our who does the show with us. And things have not looked that great, and we haven't seen a lot of progress. We haven't seen, we've seen exploration fall off in Arizona, yeah. but yeah. based on what you're talking about, okay, it's something we have to weather. It yeah. comes around historically every four or five years that we have yeah. these kinds of issues, and it's we might be looking at an upturn here in yep. the very near future. I, I hope so. Like I say, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a lot more optimistic. And, and I think, you know, these are natural breaks in the cycle, right. and we take a breather and, and catch up. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Thanks for Michael. being on the Arizona Mining Review.